All right. So um, I think at the moment we've got uh, 24 uh, people in. So thanks everybody for, for coming along. But obviously we, we we'd love to be able to host a, a real life physical meeting, but uh, circumstances dictate that we we're still limited to the um, the joys of Zoom and online technology. Um, Hopefully, though, the, the, the business will start within a minute. It won't, won't take too too long. But what I'd normally do, um, obviously, we'd be at the uh, Field Studies Council at Preston Montford or, or somewhere similar, and we'd, we'd stop for a, a short break in between business and uh, and the uh, guest speaker. So we'll, we'll see how everybody's feeling after business. We'll, we'll see how long it takes. And I'll, I'll give everybody the option of maybe taking a, a, a couple of minutes just to, to grab another drink or whatever is required in between before Catherine starts. So I'll introduce Catherine a little, a little bit later. Um, but first of all, um, I've just got a few apologies to cover and um, some more may come in, but we've got apologies from Barbara Ashton, uh, Rosie and Andrew Wood. Uh, Tris Pierce, unfortunately, hasn't been able to make it today. And uh, uh, the most recent one was from uh, Chris Cook. So, um, Again, Anne Marie, hopefully you'll, you'll, um, yeah, you'll be able to access that um, after the, the talk if you, you've missed the, the, those apologies. Um, yeah, I think Paul, Paul Wright as well. Oh, uh, yeah, Paul, I was just looking through the list. Yeah, he's definitely not made it in, has he? No. Okay. There's a, a couple of people that were, were quite keen to attend that, that I don't think were, were actually signed up as members. Um, they've messaged me now, but I, I thought we'd take the opportunity today to sign them up as members. Um, so I'll keep an eye on them. They, they may may pop in at, at some point during proceedings. Right. Well, uh, the introduction. Uh, I would normally be reviewing what we've been up to for the last year, but um, it, it's, you, you're all very aware we've been very limited on the, the amount of activity that, that we've been able to, to coordinate. Um, we've been very limited with uh, survey work for obvious reasons when it comes to social distance, and it's very difficult to run small mammal surveys and. Some of the other things that we would normally like to get on with. Um, the, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Hopefully, uh, this year we'll, we'll start to um, be able to get back to um, activities in the field again. So we'll, we'll obviously keep everybody updated uh, as as we hear more uh, and as the situation progresses. Now, having said that, you don't have to go very far to make mammal records. Uh, and of course, for any new members uh, that haven't been to our AGMs or events before. Um, we're very much uh, a group based on recording mammal activity and that doesn't necessarily mean recording mammal activity that we use survey equipment like long worth traps for. We can of course um, just make uh, spontaneous mammal records uh, of anything that you might see out and about. So um, I still encourage people to send in records uh, and keep an eye out for uh, things like hedgehogs which people will, will hopefully be seeing emerging in the next few weeks uh, depending on the weather of course. Uh, even in urban areas, you can see things like foxes and um, lots of, of our members I know live in semi-rural areas. Uh, even in places on the, the outskirts of Shrewsbury, we've got pol polecat records coming in. So there, there are still mammals out there to, to keep an eye out for. So as always, if you, you see anything in your local area, you can send those records to smgrecord uh, at gmail.com. Nearly got it wrong. Um, over the, the, the last year or so, we, we've also managed to progress the Atlas, which um, uh, th really thanks to Malcolm for, for driving that forward. And at the moment, the, the, the Atlas um, is basically taking the form of, of an online Atlas, and that's available to watch or, or to, to view even on our website. Um, I think at the moment, Malcolm's still waiting on a couple, including one from me um, on, on Pine Martin, sorry, which um, I'm not, not setting a very good example. But um, it's, it's well worth having a look at, and the, the hope is that we, we can kind of expand on uh, the work that's uh, being put into the, the Atlas at some point and look at publishing it as an actual hard copy rather than just having a, a digital, digital copy. But at the moment, the digital copy suffices, and at least we can update that as, as time goes on. So again, thank you to Malcolm for helping to coordinate that, and to all contributors for, for sending in your little bits of information. We've had lots of um, people within the group involved in sending their, their species um, pages. So uh, again, those can all be seen on the website. And 
that's really all I can say but when it comes to the, the, the activity over the last few months it's, it's obviously been a quiet year but the hope is um, uh, and this is moving on to um, what would normally be point two of the agenda where we start to discuss our, our events and activities over the last few months. Uh, we, we haven't got a huge amount to, to discuss looking back but sorry I'm just going to let somebody else in there. Oh, somebody's been to it. Thank you whoever that was. Um, so what we can really do is, is start looking forwards to, to events that we can do um, as, uh, as the situation progresses and hopefully some restrictions start to uh, become uh, lifted over the next few months but um, I am very I must admit I was quite blase when it came to the um, the uh, COVID outbreak last year when it came to uh, going out and still taking occasional volunteers out to check camera traps and things but now um, uh, I've got experience with my family have seen just how serious this um, this disease can be uh, if, if people do get a serious uh, bout of it so um, I've woken up to the fact that it's really not worth taking the risk at the moment. Um, uh, the, the person I, that I'm talking about has, has basically picked it up from, from being outdoors and they're not talking about the, these cases of transmission outdoors very often so um, I'm really quite keen to, to avoid us uh, having a, an outbreak uh, because of us running a, an event. Um, so at the moment we, we can still do bits and pieces online and we're always open to online suggestions um, or email suggestions for any events that you might be interested in but we have um, coerced or I don't know we'd have to coerce Rick he loves talking about bones but Rick will be doing a, an online bone workshop or introduction to bones um, in, in the next couple of months so we'll, we'll send further details of that as, uh, as they get um, arranged uh, over the next few weeks and there's also other opportunities when restrictions do start to lift with um, things like hedgehog surveys. So um, Catherine Jones, who you will all see a little bit later, um, is always looking to help with the Shropshire Hedgehog Project. Um, within Shropshire Wildlife Trust, we've also got um, opportunities for people to get involved with water shrew uh, surveys and that the Rivers team at Shropshire Wildlife Trust uh, have set a, a target of, of really developing a, a better image a, a picture of water tree populations and, and spread across Shropshire. So a, again as more information comes out I'm hoping that we can do a bit of cross partnership work between SMG and SWT. Um, of course that nothing's set in stone at the moment this is all um, these are being preliminary talks and more details will, will be released when we know what we can actually do. And uh, it wouldn't really be right of me to go for a whole year without mentioning pine martins. So uh, again, pine martins will uh, continue to be uh, surveyed and monitored over the next few months. And I was really quite keen to get as many people out as possible last year, but obviously uh, we couldn't. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to make up for that this year. Um, particularly now, I've, uh, I've had quite a productive year with the camera traps in, in new areas around the, the Stiper Stones, and there's a very good chance um, now I'm seeing a stable population and stable records of Martins there that we're going to find scats and DNA at some point. So there's things to look forward to and things that you can still get involved with, but obviously it's just going to be a case of watch this space and we'll, we'll see um, what dates we can come up with once we know it's safe to do so. But as I mentioned, anybody that's interested in events, uh, you can and um, always drop us a line if there's somewhat, something you'd, you'd like to suggest. Sorry, my chair's just thrown. Uh, anything you'd like to suggest, um, we'll, we'll see see what you can get involved with or, or possibly um, there's also the, the Dormouse group, of course, and, and other groups doing a bit of mum monitoring so we can put you in contact with other groups too. So that, that's, um, that's really um, as much as I can say when it comes to events. So now I'd like to hand you over to our Treasurer and Membership Officer Malcolm who will give us uh, an update on um, uh, current banking uh, finances and membership. Well, what I was going to suggest actually is if um, you'd like to you can flick over to um, something called speak of you at the top of the page on, on, on Zoom so if you just want to see the person that's speaking you should just be able to see them and you can uh, move the, the various bits and pieces of like the, the windows with faces on the right too when you're going to speak of you. So over to you Malcolm. 
Uh, we can see your slides, which is very good. That's a good start. Right, you should be able to hear me in a moment too now. I've unmuted myself. We can hear you. Got to go. Excellent. Well, um, greetings from a, a snowy North Shropshire. It's started snowing again. And um, anyway, um, as Stuart has said, our activities this year have been somewhat impacted by the lockdowns and other restrictions. And that's had an obvious knock-on effect on the... Um, turnover. So this year, well last year, 2020, all payments and receipts have actually been in the membership cost centre um, and uh, the um, receipts from member, oh I, let, let's, let's actually give, have a slideshow, might be the best idea, here we are. Um, the receipts from subscriptions total £775, that's the, the gross amount, um, no other income. On the outgoing side, um, the membership subscriptions, you will remember, are used to finance the sort of um, fixed and ongoing um, costs of running the group. So they support things like last year's AGM, where we hired a room and paid for a speaker, um, the, the web space, the Mammal Society affiliation, software, insurance, and things like this. And that totaled 580 uh, pounds and however many pence that's got covered up. Um, oh, two. Right. Um, we also, there's also uh, £21.77 in fees for the direct debit scheme. That's gone up quite a bit since uh, a couple of years ago. Firstly, GoCard has increased their fees and then uh, they had to put VAT on their fees as well. Not on the subscription, but on the, on the, um, on the fee. It's still worth doing, I think, um, because it saves me an aw a lot of hassle and um, saves you having to remember. So... Um, I think it works well. Um, this and um, means that there was, in fact, a total expenditure of 606.79, uh, which means that we had um, S of income over expenditure of 168.21. Now, I so said all the activity was in the uh, membership fund, so there's been no movement in any of the other funds. Um, you can just see the current situation there. Um, we've got just over a thousand um, unascribed to anything in particular. SCDN and research, 2448. Um, you'll notice that there's no um, income from SCDN this year. We've got a sort of ongoing dispute with them about um, payments due for um, records from the, the last couple of years. So hopefully that will be resolved at some point. Um, and then there's been no expenditure in any of the other um, um, cost centers. So overall funds have increased by 16821 to 6,820 and 22p. Any, uh, any questions on, on that? Um, you have got the sort of the more detailed um, things sent to you by email. Uh, I, I just have a, a quick question, Mark, and uh, regarding the, the money we've got in there for, there's obviously £700 that was put aside for, for Pine Martin work. Yeah, yeah. At the moment, the uh, Shropshire Wildlife Trust budget that, that we'd, um, well, we did some crowdfunding for that is pretty much spent. So um, when it comes to equipment, um, maintenance things there, batteries is, is a bit of a problem, so I was wondering if members might have a, uh, be happy for me to dip into those funds for purchasing batteries for camera traps that are currently sat indoors doing nothing. I would, I would imagine that would be, be fine. I mean, it's something which can be, we've got a committee meeting coming up very soon, haven't we? Yeah. Um, which we can confirm then, because, I mean, your um, Pine Martin project sort of overlaps the two things and it's the main main yeah. way we can contrib contribute really to Pine Martin research. 
Yeah. So, um, on the on the agenda for uh, the meeting, I think. Yeah, I'll make sure that's on the agenda for the next. Meeting. <coughs> yeah. Thought you would. <laughs> Any objections? Any, anything else on uh, on money matters? Right. So, uh, shall I go on to membership? Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, please do. Please do. Please do. Yeah. Oh, was, um, can, I, can I ask if if the uh, Shropshire Back Group, John Morgan, um, has had money from the SEDN? If other groups are suffering in the same way as the mammal group? No, we've had nothing from them uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, we've got a little bit of a, an outstanding um, disagreement. I've uh, been speaking to Fran back in December and we're looking at changes. Um, um, we're going to be looking basically March. Uh, we're going to have some more discussions. End of February, beginning of <coughs> March. So things look like they'll be moving forward um, to a better understanding about records and how they're used. Thank you very much. Mm. Similar story by the sound of it. Okay. All right, thank you for that, Malcolm. Should we, uh, if there's no other questions, should we move on to uh, the membership report? Well, there might not have been much activity finan <coughs> finan <coughs> excuse me, financially, but um, there's been a lot of activity membership-wise. And uh, we finished 2020 with uh, both the total membership and the number of new members during the year at record levels, believe it or not. So we've actually acquired 28 new members during the year, um, plus three lapsed members who've come back to the fold. Uh, we have, however, lost 12 for a, a wide variety of reasons. So <clears throat> the, um, the lack of field activities hasn't actually cost us members. Um, and I think we must say a big thank you to Rick for his fantastic newsletter as being one of the attractions. And I think the other one um, which probably helps is the, the members only Facebook page, um, which now has 133 members. So the great majority of our members actually do belong to that um, and as I mentioned in the last newsletter um, we are going to be looking at putting uh, local clusters of well, shall I say giving the opportunity for members in sort of local groups to, to get together and if they're, if they're happy to share contact details because it's a big county and there might be some opportunity for smaller local groups, particularly survey work, things like that. So um, you will be hearing from me in, in due course. So I think that's probably as much as I've got to say about um, membership, um, unless there are any questions or comments. And then other than to, you know, no comments, even to thank Rick for his, uh, his hard work and for, for doing a fantastic magazine, <coughs> which I'm sure well, people are joining up for the magazine at the moment. Uh, and one, one final thing from me, um, Stuart. Um, in the absence of real cake, I thought you might like a virtual cake. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and very fitting for this year. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's flooded out, poor old otter. Right, that's uh, that's my bit then. Excellent. Sorry, uh, Malcolm, I'm just going to unmute myself. Thank you very much for the kind comments about the newsletter. Um, also, please could you confirm exactly how many members we do have? Um, 164. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, sorry. I, <coughs> I went over, I, I skipped that figure. Yeah, 164. Right, thank you. Um, I think we're going to lose one or two in the next month, but um, it'll still be a record. Yeah, yeah. Very impressive. Right. Well, I'll, uh, thank you for the cake. Yeah, enjoy the cake because it's okay. about to be uh, scoffed. <laughs> right. Thanks very much, Malcolm. So um, I am going to try and do a screen share myself now. I've tested this, so it should be absolutely fine. Um, the next point on the agenda was the committee member um, committee nominations. So hopefully you can see the screen share now. I've, I've tried to, to put our nominations into uh, 
some kind of understandable order, which um, yeah, so hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, I've, I've been a bit lazy and uh, referred to everybody by, by initial. So I'll just read these out for everybody. <clears throat> um, I am quite happy to carry on uh, as chairman. Um, I mean, I've got a great, great committee behind me that and Malcolm has been incredibly supportive. Uh, at times that I've, I've been a little bit too busy to to fill out everything that, that I'd like to do for the, the group. So I'm more than happy to continue. And uh, thank you to Malcolm uh, for nominating me and, and Marie has also seconded me. And uh, it, it does look like we're all um, doing each other a favour here when I read these out. But, uh, it's the, the same case uh, every year. Um, so for Secretary Anne-Marie McKinnon has, has done a fantastic job in the, the first year or so of uh, taking over the role of, of Secretary. So I thank Anne-Marie as well for taking all our minutes. And Anne-Marie uh, I've nominated and that's been seconded by Malcolm. Now, Malcolm again, somebody else doing a fantastic job and I'm glad that you're okay to carry on Malcolm. Um, as treasurer, and uh, of course, I'll, um, I'll we can buy in your role. So, multi talented Malcolm is treasurer and the membership officer. So, Anne Marie has nom nominated Malcolm, and I've seconded that. Now, on to our ordinary members uh, Rick Morris, uh, again, is, is keen to continue. Uh, Tris Pierce, yeah. who unfortunately isn't at the meeting today, has nom <coughs> excuse me, nominated Rick. And that's been seconded by Jan McElvey. Uh, Trist Pierce uh, has been nominated, nominated by Jan McElvey and second, seconded by Rick Morris. <coughs> and Jan McElvey is nominated by Rick Morris and that has been seconded by Lynn Bassenny. Uh, Lynn has been nominated by Anne Marie and seconded by Logan Adrian. And uh, Lorcan himself has been nominated by Linda Senyu, and I've seconded Lorcan's nomination. <coughs> and of course, uh, Lorcan will continue uh, to be the county mammal recorder too. And Peter Marshall uh, will continue as a committee member, has been nominated by uh, Lorcan and seconded by Malcolm Mooney. And in addition to our uh, committee uh, this year, um, I've nominated uh, or seconded even uh, Linda Senya originally nominated <coughs> Catherine Jones, and Catherine is going to be giving us a talk shortly after our business. And she's uh, a very enthusiastic um, hedgehog officer at Shropshire Wildlife Trust, a hedgehog training officer, and she's done an amazing job over the last twelve months or so. Of um, coordinating the Shropshire Hedgehog project. So I'm delighted to have Catherine on board. She's, she's going to be able to help out a bit with coordinating some events. And of course, all Mammal Group members will be um, invited to any local events that, that <coughs> by Catherine and the, the Hedgehog project over the next few months. So that's everybody at the moment. But you can see that we've, um, I was meant to count everybody up to four, six, seven. So we've got, still got space in the committee for, for another member. Um, so if anybody is interested, please drop um, me or any of the other committee members uh, an email. You, you can find our email addresses on the, the website or the newsletters. And we will we'll happily accept any, any new uh, nominations, so please drop us a line. So that, that's uh, our committee nominations. Uh, are there any questions before I move on uh, regarding nominations? No objections. Everybody looks happy to me. So if that's the case, I will stop that screen share so you can see my ugly face again. Sorry. Mm. And um, really, that that just leads us on to um, any other business and closing remarks. So um, at this point, I'll just ask uh, members if there's anything you would like to uh, comment on. Any questions that you'd like to ask. Now is the opportunity to unmute yourselves, or give us a wave, and ask the question. If I don't see anybody waving, if not, I will summarise. And uh, I can't. 
that. I'm just trying to change my view so I can see everybody's faces. I can't see anybody waving. <laughs> now I've just uh, looked at everybody's pictures. It was nice to see that Craig Baker has got a photo of himself in the bath. <laughs> well done, Craig. Anti aging. <laughs> and, yeah, Tim back as well. Just don't look too closely. <laughs> okay, so closing remarks then, if, if there's no other questions. Uh, really, the, 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 again, the, there's, uh, there's not a lot that I can talk about um, with regards to activity at the moment, but what I can do is thank all of our members for your continued support. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to make up for, for the lost time over the last few months, so the, the last nearly 12 months uh, and start with a few more events. But as always, just send your mammal records through to, uh, to, to Lorcan, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're always keen to collect mammal records. And of course, unless we, we've got the mammal records coming in, we can't protect the animals, but we need to know as much as we can about them as possible. And that's probably even more important now with the um, development plans for Shropshire uh, coming into, into action. So we need to make sure that uh, developers aren't completely decimating habitat right left and centre. So thank you all for sitting through the official part of the, the AGM today. What I think I might do is just give everybody a couple of minutes break if that's okay and, if, uh, and then we'll come back um, for Catherine's presentation on her jobs. Um, what should, should we say? Is, I'd normally say about 10 and I'm now going to hand you over to Catherine, which um, hopefully everybody can see. Uh, again, I recommend if you put it on to speak of you at the top, you'll be able to see Catherine as she's speaking. And Catherine is, uh, as I mentioned, the um, trainee hedgehog officer at Shropshire Wildlife Trust, uh, and she's now uh, working with the people and wildlife team to, to help. Well, the, she was going to be helping with a, a few of the kids' events and things, but obviously that's uh, a little bit limited at the moment. Uh, but Catherine's done an amazing job of, of getting other people enthused in hedgehogs and um, you'll struggle to find anybody that's more enthusiastic about hedgehogs than Catherine. So I'm going to hand you over to Catherine now. Catherine, can you, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Right. So I'm going to turn off my video and it's over to you, Catherine. Okay. Uh, can you see that all right? Is that okay? Yeah, that's coming through perfectly clear. Great. Um, yep, so for the past year um, in Shropshire, I have just created a little project um, largely focused towards a big community vibe. So gardens and, and getting people involved with uh, the hedgehogs that are on their own patch uh, at home um, that they can get involved with. So I had... Um, I think I had about four or five areas initially interested um, last year. But of course, COVID came along um, and I was only able to successfully begin the project and really get, get into the project with two areas. So a lot of the areas that wanted to be involved have now been rolled on to this year with quite a few of the other areas that are um, quite interested as well. So this presentation will be focusing on the two areas that I was able to conduct my project in and how it all turned about, um, the results of that and, and basically what we got up to and the, the effect it's had on the community. So it's, it's the first time I've sort of shared how last year went, so it's quite nice to, to see visually how we've done. So. Um, so I'll be covering a bit about the introduction to the project, so what exactly it is, what, 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 what it's about, the aims of the project, the outline of it, so how it worked, what we did, um, introducing the two areas that were involved, the phase one part of the project, and phase two, which um, was involved a bit more involvement from people. Um, the main summary of results, the lessons we learnt so far in the project, so what we can learn from and carry on with, 
and the plans for this year. So who's going to be involved? So when I was beginning my role um, as a hedgehog officer trainee, I the first thing I was hit with was a lot of interest from people sort of telling me that their own areas, they'd seen loads of sightings of hedgehogs. They, they had lots of hedgehogs and they were really enthusiastic um, to, to just get me to do something uh, to do with their area. Um, and they were experiencing this abundance of sightings and wanted to encourage the visits further to their own sort of gardens. Um, and I'm, I'm well aware that way before the millennium, we were looking at over 36 million hedgehogs in the UK. And we're now looking at under 1 million and declining every single day. So a lot of people don't realise the extent to which we're unfortunately losing our hedgehogs. We just expect them to always be there. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And we do really need to step in. So this project actually provided this opportunity to tackle these issues, these pockets of hedgehog populations in towns and villages in the county and help us to focus our effort, efforts on these hotspots. So, for example, introducing some questionnaires to get a bit of initial information and, and really getting to know each and every garden that we visited and how we could help them personally. So our project aims were to better understand and record hedgehog populations in Shropshire towns and villages, to reduce the barriers to hedgehog movement across Shropshire, to increase people's knowledge about how they can help hedgehogs, and to inspire groups of neighbours to act together as a community for their hedgehogs and to celebrate their successes from the project as well. So the project adopted quite an experimental approach because I, I hadn't done something to this scale before. We didn't know what would work well, what would work best. So we wanted to determine if a common interest and enthusiasm was present for the themes of the project, um, being hedgehog awareness, encouraging hedgehogs to the gardens, advice, support, guidance on hedgehog friendly features, things like this. So it was split into two phases. The first phase being that we wanted to determine the hedgehog sightings initially in each area so that we could build a picture of where these populations were in the area, sort of what pockets there were, um, if there were corridors present that they were using that we could get from these questionnaires. And phase two was initiate it. It was more of an active approach, so there was a little option that people could tick if they wanted to be further involved um, in the project. So this would be where we brought more direct improvements to each garden, advice and guidance tailored to their gardens and what they could begin working on to encourage hedgehogs to their gardens. So these phases were achieved by this initial questionnaire distribution through the post without any contact because we were aware we were fresh out of um, lockdown and we didn't want to make anyone uncomfortable. We were being really safe, um, but I will touch on that a, a bit more in a bit. So the two areas that the project managed to focus on last year was Little Wenlock, um, Little Village, by the Reekin and Clive Village, which is just north of Shrewsbury. So Little Wenlock, it's, it was the first project area to, to take interest. So we actually had a, a, a person of contact for each area that we would talk to and coerce with um, to, to bring the project to that area. So that's just a little bit of information about the village. Not many people it was a small village but I feel this was a brilliant place to start to actually test the waters in community involvement and see what people were, were willing to try and, and how well they got into the project so there was no shop no post office things like that literally an innocent village houses a really thriving community um, everyone knew each other so it, it was really interesting to see how it set off um, the parish just have these five um, 
sort of pillars of thriving community life. They're really community driven, which I was really impressed by. So they have an innovative parish council, an active village hall and playing field committee, an outward looking church community, a thriving local inn. A lot of people know the, the Huntsman uh, Inn and a vast individual volunteer network. So lots of people were really into trying things and it was a brilliant village to start with. And then we got onto Clive Village through a contact of one of the gardeners at work actually at the Shropshire Wildlife Trust. Um, so it's a little village um, just to the west of Grins Hill who, who are actually one of the areas for this year as well. So again, they, they didn't have many um, social sort of gathering areas. They had a little post office a little community hall and actually a little village shop so a tiny bit more than a little Wenlock but what I did notice was that a lot of the roads really really busy main roads that just go straight through the villages there weren't really many parking spots or pedestrian paths on the sides so it's something new to tackle with um, especially the roads which are very quickly found out would become quite a focus of the project. So phase one of the project was focusing on questionnaires that were distributed in each area. So the project was initially on hold. We, we were meant to start in uh, May time and, and, and to do a lot more areas than we did, but we actually didn't commence until the first national lockdown did ease um, around 18th of June was when we, we officially started distributing questionnaires in Little Wenlock. So I was with my point of contact, who's named Valerie, and we social distanced for the whole period. And me and her did opposite ends of the village and sort of worked our way around um, just posting. I think we posted about Oh, I have actually written it down how many we posted. That would help. 124 um, questionnaires through the village. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, they were just a, a, a number of houses, a bit more than that number, but they were a bit more on the outskirts of the village. So we, we did as many as we could, a big bulk load during the day. And that's how many we were able to distribute and in Clive Village, 160. So similar numbers that were distributed through every house of the village. Oh. Um, and Valerie was quite keen to have a strict deadline on the questionnaires of two weeks. Um, she'd had experience as a project manager and knew that if we left it a bit longer than that, people would just forget about the questionnaires and wouldn't post them back. Um, so it was her idea to set up this little box at the village hall and she loyally went to empty it every single day um, at the end of the day to see if anyone had posted any back in. And she also offered up her home address for people to post their questionnaires back as well. So it, it actually worked incredibly well and we were really quite surprised at, at how involved people were. People were already waiting for me to post the questionnaire when we started because the word had just got round so quickly um, that a hedgehog project was coming. And especially right out of lockdown, a lot of people just wanted something to focus on in their gardens. So it was ideal timing to really get into this project and see what, what we could bring out of it. <clears throat> so, the first side of the questionnaire focused on basically the hedgehogs in the village, the sightings of hedgehogs in the village. So these can be alive or deceased sightings, so roadkill, alive, dead, where, where they were seen, where these sightings were, so if in the garden, the front garden, the roads, the shops, you know, anywhere. And if they provided any active hedgehog encouragements in their garden, such as water, supplementary food, they had a highway hole, a hedgehog house, so specific hedgehog things they were doing, already doing to encourage hedgehogs. And then the second side of the questionnaire was more focused on the gardens themselves. So the garden size 
and the levels of connectivity so which boundaries they had going around the garden if it was fencing if it was hedgerows if they had open driveways gaps all of these were taken into consideration and wildlife friendly features so a lot of hedgehog friendly features co um, connect with general wildlife ones so we were just looking for all of it what they already had um, if any pets frequented the garden if they let their dogs out at night things like that and of course pesticide use which was a huge one that we wanted to know so these are the actual questionnaires themselves that we began to give out in Little Wenlock. Of course, we tweaked the information at the top a little bit when we started on the second area. Um, but it's just a basic tick questionnaire. Um, but the main point that was really good was section three, where we just got their name, their address and their email. And there's this section at the bottom where we we asked if they would be interested in finding out a bit more in the project, taking part further. And that was where phase two would initiate and they would get a bit more involved. So all we did was just send an email. So it was very non-intrusive. We didn't want to hound at their door all the time and ask if they wanted to do more. We just left it up to them to decide. And, and if they wanted to get involved, we were really happy that they would. So phase one in Little Wenlock was the questionnaire phase. So the data from the questionnaires showed that just over half of the questionnaires were received back by the deadline with 54% having seen live hedgehogs or evidence of hedgehogs such as droppings um, in and around their gardens. So at first glance, this might not seem too impressive but it was a lot of people that wanted to get involved and they really really did get get involved and stick their their feet in so 80 percent of all these sightings were in gardens on these roads called church lane crofters view clee rise and spout lane and three of these were considered the main roads of the village so some of them were main roads in and out of the village where the majority of these deceased hedgehogs had also been seen. So instantly we saw a correlation in roadkill and the main roads of the village. Upon discussing the topic with multiple members of the village, um, including the Speedwatch residents, which was an active um, watch that was going on, it was clear that quite a few drivers did not stick to the 30 mile per hour limit that went through the village. So there was one main road and a really sharp bend that went round and people just didn't really stick to the limit and just sped through the village, um, especially when approaching this bend that was in, in the centre of the village, which was really dangerous. So Valerie also discovered that the highest and most frequent hedgehog sightings were along a straight line through some of the main roads of the village. So we instantly identified a corridor that hedgehogs were using through the gardens. And this was really positive news in terms of the connectivity of the village. So we instantly could recognise um, a corridor that they were using, which was really good. So it was determined that the Little Wenlock hedgehog population was an active and growing one um, due to these clusters of hedgehogs being identified on a regular basis. So all that may be separating these clusters from joining could be simple lack of connectivity in one or two gardens, um, whereas if they just inserted a hole in their garden they could actually make this corridor even bigger. So. A brilliant 65% of gardens said that they took active steps to support hedgehogs and wildlife in their garden with over 100 households having left wild areas specifically. Regularly putting out water and food had garden connectivity or provided hedgehog houses. So this is all from questionnaires and a whopping 86% of households also confirmed that they did not use pesticides or slug pellets at all. So this has suggested that Little Wenlock was already quite a good example of a hedgehog friendly village and simply needed to just pass on these examples and ideas between the community to increase this impact even further. So the garden boundaries of, of Little Wenlock, 
Um, in terms of connectivity, we see that the largest group, 55% of gardens, had mixed access for hedgehogs. So this was, it could be fencing, but with loads of gaps or an open driveway. It could be a mix of hedgerows and fencing or walls. Basically, hedgehogs could get in and out of the garden somewhere. So this confirmed connectivity in gardens through so some sort of way. The second largest group, 36% of gardens, had easy access for hedgehogs. So hedgerows, holes, they had it all. They knew hedgehogs could get in and out. So the smallest group, 9% of gardens, had no connectivity at all. And th this was a really small percentage, so we could easily focus on this percentage to give this advice on connectivity and suggest what they could do to actually improve their gardens. The hedgehog sightings. Um, so there was a positive response in terms of live hedgehog sightings. So we were reaching 28 live sightings in total. And 23 of those were being in gardens. So this suggests that hedgehogs are thriving in these gardens and have enough connectivity through these gardens to keep the majority of the population away from roads. However, there were nine deceased sightings in total with 50% of these deceased sightings on roads. So this strongly suggests that the main cause of hedgehog mortality in the village was the roads acting as barriers through their connected habitat and that drivers were hitting them as they cross, mostly pointing towards the fact they weren't keeping to the speed limit as well. Unfortunately, it's known that drivers do speed in the village, so we were constantly keeping that in mind as we were going through. The gardens did have quite an abundance of diverse hedgehog friendly garden features. So 63 households in total had at least one hedgehog friendly garden feature, with hedges, shrubs, wild areas, log piles being the most abundant. So features that may more actively encourage hedgehogs, such as these hedgehog houses, supplementary food, highway holes, fresh water, these were a bit less abundant than the natural areas they had left. So this suggested that the advice we would point to would be these specific hedgehog encouragements um, and explaining the benefits of adding them to their garden and what, what it could improve and how it would help attract more of their hedgehog visitors. <clears throat> so pesticide use, this was really, really great news that we got from the questionnaire in Little Wenlock. So we had really positive results with a, a great 84% of gardens confirming they did not use pesticides at all. And we did actually find that the six within the 16% of gardens that did use pesticides, they said they only used it really occasionally if they had to, um, it wasn't a regular use day in, day out. So that, that was good to hear and we could actually talk to them on, on suggestions on what they could do alternatively. So in Clive Village, this was their questionnaire results as well. So a, a two week deadline was actually given to Clive as well to return their um, questionnaires, which was decided between the main point of contact, who was called Steve. So we coerced about Clive Village and approximately 160 questionnaires were distributed on the 25th of June 2020. So this wasn't long. I think this was actually a couple of weeks after Little Wenlock. So we sort of worked side by side. And, and did it alongside together um, to, to keep it active, to keep it, well, really to keep in mind that COVID was still there. So we, we wanted to make sure that if something did happen, everyone was at the same point and we could pause and carry on and so on. And we received a total of 61 questionnaires back in Clive. So these were all posted back to Steve's home address or some people did emailed them back to me or took a picture and emailed them back to me. So <clears throat> the Clive Village summary of findings. 
It showed that approximately 61 households took part in phase one, with 52% of these having seen a live hedgehog or evidence of live hedgehogs. 33%, however, had seen a deceased or roadkill hedgehog. Particularly with Clive Village, we quickly began to realise that roadkill and speed was probably the biggest issue in the village, a really big issue. And the 20 households that had seen deceased hedgehogs in the village, their sightings had focused around the streets called High Street, Station Road, Wem Road and New Street. And again, three of these were the main roads in and out of the village. So again, this correlation was instantly picked up. And upon asking residents, many witnessed people speeding beyond the 30 miles per hour limit again through the village, causing a speed watch to actually come to play and the village really trying to focus on it. Um, furthermore, 74% of hedgehog sightings included gardens on these same roads as these deceased sightings. So a deceased hedgehog had also been previously found in the village hall as well actually which was quite a surprise um, and an interest began to grow for road signs for the village to be put up in these hot spots to try and tackle the issue as a step forward. The majority of hedgehog sightings on these mentioned main roads through the village it was clear that the main focus was that there was a possible corridor through these main roads which was confirmed with the opinions of Steve and his neighbours, as well as the results from the questionnaire. So these areas really had to be focused on, on as these hotspots. It was really instantly clear that the roads and the speed were instantly the problem in this village. So the garden boundaries for Clive, they had 48% of easy access for the village. So a little less, all of these are a little less than Little Wenlock. Um, but it was still pretty good results that we found. So the largest group um, had either, you know, hedgerows again, some, some fence holes, things like that. And there was a, a similar amount of some access, so a mix of access for hedgehogs. So there was almost a, a half split between these, which was really good news. Um, and again, nine, just 9% nine that had no access. So, so hedgehogs couldn't get in and out of their garden. So again, we could easily focus on this small percent um, of residents to suggest advice, support on what they could do next to improve that. So the hedgehog sightings in Clive, there's a clear correlation between the live hedgehog sightings and gardens and the deceased hedgehog sightings and roads. So 32 live sightings were recorded with 30 of these being in gardens. So 20 deceased sightings were recorded and 19 of these were on the roads. So that instantly told us what we needed to know essentially. It couldn't be a clearer indication to us that the main cause of mortality in the village was roadkill. So again these were also focused, the deceased sightings were focused around the main roads of the village so we knew what we needed to know and where we needed to focus straight away. The hedgehog friendly features <clears throat> again showed a large number of gardens having already having wild habitats present. So it, it was actually also plenty of these hedgehog encouragements that were in place to begin with as well. So a slightly more um, high frequency than Little Wenlock that we instantly identified. 57 households in total had at least one hedgehog friendly garden feature. And a lot of the Clive Gardens did already have brilliant habitats that were already suited for hedgehogs. Some gardens were also providing this supplementary food, hedgehog houses, and we just needed to target people to actually, well, more people to be encouraged to provide these active encouragements again. So hedgehog houses, the supplementary food, they were again the lower number that people already did. But we did actually have a gentleman who started building hedgehogs for people in the village after our initial visit. So it very quickly, the enthusiasm started spreading and we could see people really getting into that straight away. 
And finally, the pesticide use in Clive, again, was really good. So we had a clear, positive 80% of people not using pesticides in their garden, with only 20% confirming their use. This suggested again that a large portion of the village were already aware of the harm of pesticides to hedgehogs and wildlife. And we could then focus on spreading the awareness to this 20% of the examples and ideas of their neighbouring residents on why they shouldn't perhaps use these and what alternatives they could use in their place. Phase two. So phase two led into focusing on these gardens and making them specifically hedgehog friendly with with the help of the residents so it involved residents who had ticked the box at the bottom of the questionnaire to say they were interested in further project involvement so the phase entered into the offering of advice guidance and support towards actually making gardens more hedgehog friendly and encouraging hedgehogs if they're perhaps not present already <clears throat> so the way we did this we emailed each resident who had ticked this option on the questionnaire with a set of three options they could choose for phase two so the email options we went to were option one, which was I would like to find out whether hedgehogs visit my garden. So this would involve placing a wildlife camera in the garden for a period of one week to record if they have hedgehog activity. Um, I'd like to note this project was undertaken during summer when hedgehogs were at the peak of activity. So they would then receive a copy of the camera shots if they did actually receive footage of hedgehogs so we were providing this service of bringing a camera trap to their gardens to see if they actually had hedgehogs if they weren't sure option two was that they would like to know more about what they could do in their garden specifically so this actually involved a garden visit to provide this advice guidance and support um, and we were very, very sure to keep in mind how people felt just coming out of lockdown, that they didn't really want people walking through the house, anyone too close. So we were very clear to say that social distancing will be used, masks will be used if they wanted us to. And they were completely welcome to just usher us through side gates into the garden or just completely stay away from us if they wanted to. Um, so this is why we did these email options because we knew not everyone would want actual interaction um, and, and not everyone was comfortable with the same approach. So that's where option three came in, where people could just ask for an email discussion on a specific issue they had in their garden or something they, they had a question, absolutely anything. We would just do it by email and nothing else and we wouldn't bother them anymore. So we wanted this approach really relaxed to keep everyone comfortable and just get involved however they would like really. So phase two, which was these email options for Little Wenlock. So for those who chose option one, which was a camera in their garden for a week, we had seven residents that chose this option between 14th of July and 18th of August in 2020. Um, we would like to note they could choose multiple options so some of these people may have had option two as well. Three out of seven of these residents did have hedgehog footage in their garden um, and three more actually already had a camera or brought a camera and had footage on their own cameras. So we had sightings in these three main roads, which I mentioned before, where the questionnaire sightings were actually initially identified. And this matched up to the initial questionnaire sightings, which I've just said. <laughs> um, and this was one of the main roads. So a few of the sightings that were seen. So hedgehog footage was confirmed at this residence between the 22nd and 29th of July. It was determined that the residents had great connectivity between gardens, but also front to back gardens, as well as both neighbours 
actually had confirmed hedgehog sightings as well. So we already knew there was a direct corridor along Spout Lane, um, which was at the very entrance of the village. So this was really positive news. And this resident actually didn't really know if she had hedgehogs in her garden. And as soon as she realised, she started putting out food um, and buying a hedgehog house. And it was really nice to see. This was one of her neighbours. So this neighbour got this footage between the 23rd and 30th of July. And this resident, upon hearing of the project coming to the village, after the questionnaire phase, she had actually brought a hedgehog house and started putting out food before our garden visit. And this is where we've received the footage. So it, it proved that she had not initially attracted hedgehogs to her garden and proved a really good example for her neighbours and what they could do as well. This was another main road of the village again um, and this gentleman he knew he had a bit of a, a highway connection under this gravel board and we managed to actually capture this footage of a hedgehog that was just back and forth every single night. It, it was quite possibly multiple hedgehogs. Um, and this was between the 28th of July and the 4th of August. So it was a very well connected garden and he had bought a hedgehog house. And after our garden visit, he actually also um, made a feeding station, which I do have a photo of shortly. So in terms of results for option two, which were the garden visits, eight residents, uh, chose option two for their garden visits. It was the most popular option. So a lot of people were really interested in this section. And six out of eight of these residents shared the visual evidence of improvements they had put in their gardens, either during our garden visit afterwards, sort of during the project period upon hearing of the project. So again, these are mainly three of these roads. So Crofters View, Wellington Road and Spout Lane were three main roads um, in the village. So we had achieved our goal in focusing, especially on these main roads, as well as others that were interested. So these were a few of the visual improvements that um, residents made on Crofters View, which was one of these main roads. So this was actually Valerie's resident who was the point of contact for this area and she received hedgehogs every single night and provided the perfect example to her neighbours for what they could do. So we found fresh hedgehog scat literally just on a, a garden visit that I took a picture of and she actually while I was there she had a hedgehog in her house that was snoring quite loudly actually. So she had a hedgehog that we've got all brilliant footage of perfect food she had footage and she also installed one of our road signs that we were giving out as well during our resource packs so she was just a brilliant example for people and and i couldn't sort of express that enough when we were going around the village this was the gentleman who had the hedgehog squeezing under the gravel board so he ended up putting a hedgehog house in and testing where to put it, see what would work best. And he also built a feeding station for his hedgehogs as well, which was just brilliant. And this was actually from one of the leaflets we had included in his resource packs. Um, I don't think I've mentioned them actually. The, the garden visits did involve us giving them a, a plastic wallet full of resources. So leaflets, bookmarks, um, information sheets they had a whole set to look at and digest after our visits so these proved really popular and people really enjoyed just looking at them once i'd gone and and seeing what would work in their gardens so this was wellington road initially they also chose option one and didn't receive any hedgehog footage on their camera uh, but after our talk he was going to install a hedgehog highway in his side gate because his whole back garden was just gravel boards um, and he later sent me these pictures after doing that and showing that he now had a hedgehog visitor and he was amazed because he didn't think his garden was set for hedgehogs and it just set him on the road to also adding more improvements and enjoying his new visitors. 
this resident was on the road that had the most roadkill sightings and he was also the resident who provided the greatest example to the rest of the village he really took off with wanting to spread this awareness so in our resource packs we did give out these a4 road signs which without hassling councils and, and going through all that you could just pop it on your wheelie bin or in your front driveway and he instantly put it on his bin he's right at the entrance to that road really visible he built this uh, hedgehog house as well and he also built a feeding station installed a hedgehog highway and also put this road sign out the front of his property as well so this was all after our garden visit and we had mentioned that there were hedgehogs in the area the first thing he actually did was put this hedgehog hole in his front gate and the next night there was hedgehog scat all the way up his driveway so he brought a hedgehog camera and found that he was in fact now getting hedgehogs and he's since then installed three more hedgehog holes in his back garden and it's just the greatest example and it was actually this resident that started encouraging others to do the same so they were seeing this road sign they were questioning where they could get one what it was about how they could help hedgehogs and it just started to spread from there so option three which was the email discussion we only had two residents that actually chose this option um, and they both received their answers or their possible improvements through email discussion and one of these was in the main um, hedgehog hotspot of Church Lane. So one of them was just asking, they'd love to encourage hedgehogs but they did have dogs and weren't sure what to do and the other um, actually had had some hoglets living in their woodshed and again they were worried about their own dog that was a potential threat to these hoglets so I just began to give advice on mitigations they could put in or, or start encouraging especially towards night time so limiting the time their dogs in the garden at night or watching when it's let out turning a light on to signal to hedgehogs that the dog's going to come out things like this and they, they were quite happy and and resolved um with their questions so that was really quite nice um, especially to have a long discussion with them so in Clive Village uh, option one so for option one with the camera in the gardens three residents chose this option between this period and only one of three residents had hedgehog footage on the camera that I did install but two more did again have their own cameras or footage on their own cameras that they later brought. So sightings were mainly on High Street Royal and New Street and two of these were again the main roads of the village and this matched to the initial road sightings on the questionnaires again so it was starting to be quite similar to Little Wenlock so this resident was again on one of the main roads and this footage was actually confirmed between the 8th and 15th of September so it was a bit of a later one and he had great connectivity an open driveway perfect habitat he just wanted to know how he could provide a little more for hedgehogs and we started to talk about hedgehog houses and things like that he already provided food so it was brilliant and then on drawwell on our initial visit with our camera, she didn't get any footage. Um, but after our visit, she started to put a hedgehog house in, started feeding, they started doing a lot. Um, her husband actually started building hedgehog houses for the village. And she later sent me this footage, which was really great news that they now had hedgehogs in the village. This was again on the main road. So we had footage from High Street. This was Steve, the main point of contact. So he was also putting food out for hedgehogs and getting some a, a great response from that. So option two, six residents chose this option. And only one of six residents actually shared visual evidence of these improvements. So unfortunately, Clive Village didn't share as much in terms of visual results so I couldn't really 
see how how well it had been received i only sort of was told or emailed i didn't really have many pictures um but these were on again three of the main roads so it was clear that we were focusing in the right area once again this was again on the main road so this man gentleman actually I couldn't really find many improvements for him to do because his garden was just absolutely brilliant. So he had this hedgehog house, he had a great pond, he provided food, provided water. He had a wild garden in his front garden as well, full of wildflowers, bees. And this uh, field was actually at the back of his garden where there was a clear um, run that mammals were taking down the back of his garden. And I couldn't really find a fault in his gardens so this was the actual first garden that i i didn't really i couldn't really provide any advice to but rather use it as an example for the other gardens and he was really happy for me to do that which was great so unfortunately that's the only visual evidence i received back from clive uh, clive village um but i i have heard well that they are on their way to becoming a nice hedgehog friendly village and i would like to return to carry on so the main results from Little Wenlock, 10 residents further improved their gardens for hedgehogs. And we noticed an increase in purchases of trail cameras for their gardens. So a lot more people after seeing Valerie's footage wanted to know if they had hedgehogs and it was spreading and people just wanted to get involved. And notably the road sign uh, popularity of these little road signs I was giving out um, was really recognised and it was actually requested by people who weren't even a part of the project which we're really happy to still give them out and we actually went around with the parish council chairman one of the days who wanted to put quite a few up around the village so they're now on the main council properties as well which is absolutely brilliant so they're also requested by speed watch members as well so we kind of connected with that uh, scheme which was really good and we, of course, identified these specific corridors in the village that we could focus on and continue to provide advice and support for, for those residents. For Clive Village, it is on its way to becoming a hedgehog friendly village. I just need a bit more evidence to take back and to really continue to, to see what we can do there. So six residents further improved their gardens for hedgehogs. And there was a really active buzzing interest through the community, just a lack of visual evidence that I received back. So I know the enthusiasm's there, so we're going to continue to see what we can do there um, to, to make sure Clive continues its climb to, to being a hedgehog friendly village. Um, I did wonder if in Clive perhaps the approach was a bit too relaxed, so how I, was, I wasn't physically myself putting the improvements in gardens but leaving it to residents but providing the advice and support however I did have to keep COVID in mind and what people were comfortable with and it proved that this really did prove successful in Little Wenlock and perhaps in Clive Village it just wasn't the main focus on people's minds or they just wanted to do it in their own time which was absolutely fine. Um, so we had successful road sign distribution most of all, especially in these roadkill hotspots, which was a big goal um, in Clive Village. So we could confirm that we had done that and a lot of people were really interested in those signs again. And the village did have great natural connectivity, which proved it was actually quite rare to see these fenced boundaries and there was, there was great levels of this connectivity. We just had to tackle the roads because this was a big part of the corridors hedgehogs were taking. Um, so we, we really had to focus on that and focus on the road side of things. So in the project, the lessons we've learned so far, hedgehog sighting hotspots in the villages have been focusing around the main roads that are in these villages. So the main correlation we've made is between the roads and the hedgehog sightings. This led to the clear importance of road signs so they became sought after and caught a lot of attention from people and they really wanted them and to share and spread the word. 
Um, and our main focus of the project did stay around connectivity, which was the first step. So making sure hedgehogs could actually get into gardens first and keeping these active hedgehog encouragements coming and, and advising them and getting people involved in those and enjoying them. So particularly Clive enjoyed decorating their hedgehog houses and getting involved that way. And the most important aspect of this project was the community involvement and their enthusiasm and love for their own patch of nature. So that was the main lesson I took away from this project that it's not possible unless the community are really into it and involved. And I think especially coming fresh out of lockdown, they were just more than happy to get involved and it was absolutely brilliant to see. So it helped residents develop a sense of pride and responsibility for their own gardens and their own little patch of nature. So it's nice to actually bring a project to gardens rather than bring people from their homes for something instead. So for 2021, we have some interested areas so far. So the Radbrook area in Shrewsbury, they were quite interested last year, but of course it couldn't happen. So Shrewsbury, the Radbrook area and Oswestry are actually first on the list. So we're going to try and do them alongside each other like we did with Little Wenlock and Clive. And then we have Pontsbury and Grins Hill interested and Condover and Tiberton. So those are our areas so far. And I'm sure we'll have space for a few more areas come later this year if all goes well. Um, we'll just have to see how things go. So the idea is to do two areas a month which would sound a lot but we're doing things a bit differently this year so we're adopting a more remote approach this year in response to covid because nothing's certain and i just don't think garden visits are quite right early on especially this year i don't know about later this year um, but for this year the remote approach will follow with the normal phase one of questionnaires so that will only involve just posting them through doors um, without contact. But phase two will have email options, but these will be email options for tailored resources to those gardens. So instead of the camera and the garden visits and the email discussion, we will actually provide options of um, per specific resource packs to those people. So whilst also identifying and taking things from the questionnaires so seeing oh maybe they don't put out hedgehog food so we'll involve a hedgehog food uh, resource or information sheet we will also leave those as options so they can tick they want a hedgehog house resource or um, supplementary food or wildlife cameras they can choose which resources they want to receive um, through the post or we'll deliver them by car and just post them and then they will actually have the advice and support and guidance they need just through a more remote approach and they will actually have the information they need. And we can easily adapt this if restrictions really do ease later on this year, we can bring back some more garden visits if we can. Um, but it's quite an adaptable project, which is the brilliant part. So we will adapt to government guidance and stick to that as we go ahead. So again, this is the Hedgehog Heroes of Shropshire project. So this is the whole project that we're on about. We have a Facebook page, um, if you don't already follow. And we also have our web page on the Shropshire Wildlife Trust website. So again, this is an open project. We're not finished. We've only done a couple of areas. We're just learning the whole way. And we're looking forward to adding quite a few more areas to the list and, and seeing what we can achieve across Shropshire and, and involve communities with their gardens so we we have a journey ahead um, and this is where you would need to go to follow our journey basically so uh, thank you for listening and if anyone has any questions um, I'll be glad to answer thank you very much Catherine uh, that's a brilliant talk and what I, I have gained from watching that is that we need to clone you and we need <coughs> more Catherine's out there. <laughs> it's the only way we'll get a few more hedgehog friendly. <laughs> so have we yes. got any questions? 
Any questions for Catherine? Um, I do see a couple, oh no, just one in the chat um, from Lorcan. Have you any evidence of lack of hedgehogs in areas where the new LED LED streetlights have been installed? I have, we've actually had these on our own street as well. Um, and I, I haven't actually heard of any change um, or, or sort of any lack of people having their hedgehogs visit so far. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's sort of the wrong time, um, wrong time of year to really be able to judge that properly with evidence and, and, and really test it. But it will be an interesting factor to actually test this year with these new LED streetlights and see if it's had any effect. Um, they're definitely quite different, um, less mm. of this orange hue in streets and things. So it will be quite interesting to see. Um, so I can't say for sure right now, but, but we would be quite interested to test that out. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, any other questions for Catherine? Uh, yes, I've got a hand up somewhere. Is that a question from you, Malcolm? Sorry. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, yeah. Uh, okay, so, sorry, I missed that. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Go ahead. Um, first of all, Catherine, I would like to congratulate you on such a fantastic presentation. I mean, it was so <laughs> clear, so clearly done. Um, well done, and a fantastic project. I mean, in getting people involved. Um, my question, though, was about records. Um, are you yeah. encouraging people to submit records, or are you submitting them generally? How are you going about it? Yeah, so the main way that came into the project was through the the advice support guidance kind of section. So when I would pass on our resource packs and, and show them what was inside, there would be I would particularly point towards the big hedgehog map, um, which was a big one. So Hedgehog Street, um, the campaign where they can sign up and keep updated that way. Um, but that those those were the main sorts of ways we were encouraging through actual um physical resources rather than um you know uh, verbally um and i think more of the initial plan was for me to pass on all the records i got to stuart or to to the group directly um but i can adapt and, and change to what works easier um but that was the approach taken last year um which again was quite experimental so um, I adapt and change mm. to what works easier. Presumably, the, the, this camera footage is throwing up um, records of other wildlife too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, particularly birds. <coughs> mm. birds. Um, we didn't actually get many other mammals other than rats. <laughs> I think we had a few well, rats. We're very, actually, but... we're very short of rat records. <laughs> well, there we go. I'll, I'll have to get those up. I have yeah. saved every yeah. photo so yeah. um, i will pass yeah. those on officially yes well having having had to postpone your talk from what's it last november um we look forward to being able to invite you to witch Church sometime yes wonderful mm. yeah i thank have you. space for more areas so i'm looking forward <laughs> to it <laughs> anyway thank you thank you hello catherine it's lynn hello great talk very thank impressive. you <laughs> Good uh, um, expansion of your work there. Uh, yes. My question really is looking at what you might do about these roads that are very busy, that these hedgehogs are desperate to cross. So apart from um, calming the traffic, do you have any other ideas about how you might prevent them from crossing the road or providing them with some safe mechanism of doing that? Yes, yeah, so it'll be stemming on building from our 2020 focus. So I suppose the start of this was distributing the road signs and, and actually stimulating the initial awareness and trying to actually tell people this is a problem. Um, and, and that's how we've sort of started it, but it could be a nice focus this year to build from that, go back to these areas and see what more we could do. Um, so I haven't gone into too much detail on tackling the roads themselves as much as the speed people are going and, and, and keeping this awareness up for speed. Um, so it's a good point to dive into a bit more deeper. Yeah, I agree. I think if people are driving more slowly, they're more likely to um, spot hedgehogs on the road. Yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> cross, yeah. yeah. Um, 
so that's what we're initially trying to trigger in people's minds um and then we can focus well, on and also acknowledging that they are driving through a village so they should be doing 30 or less yes so I don't I, know I actually... that, can you work with the highways agencies in order to try and perhaps drop the speed again to 20 or yes something? i was going to say um the point of contacts for both areas actually agree with me that the speed limit should be dropped at least to 20 um, so our next steps were to actually really get involved and talk with the parish councils and get this issue actually raised um, so and we could seem to be able to be the main issue in both villages doesn't it so if you yeah. have some kind of traffic calming that i don't know speed bumps or whatever people think would work in the village that seems like a good idea doesn't it there's an awful yeah. lot of mortality of on on roads with hedgehogs as you say exactly so we can use this project as evidence to back why why we need this and and it's provided a great base to start tackling this a lot more um and even those permanent hedgehog road signs that have been um added and and started to be put into place in areas um so this this was more experimental to to start stimulating this awareness and now we can work on that and work towards this which is the aim um so i'm still in contact with both areas and and this could be something we could really tackle yeah, i guess year. you could go and talk to the parish council and make your suggestions yes definitely definitely yeah, yeah. and then work alongside i don't know shropshire's highways see if they have a, an overall policy for the county and villages yeah. Exactly. It's it's shown us what the issue is, so it's a great point too. Yeah, you've got plenty of evidence, certainly for those two villages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think the more we go in this project, the more sim similar situations we're going to see, which is just going to scream even louder that that this needs to be tackled. So that's that is the aim um, to get not just residents to realise this, but actually those that can make the difference to realise. So fingers crossed we're going to work into that and see what we can do yeah great keep yeah. up the good work great thank, thank you, you. <laughs> for your information we have passed on records of road deaths to shropshire council yeah uh, in the format of a map but we've covered hedgehogs badgers red fox yeah so they are aware of it and their project was to do underpaths at certain road points which were quite a uh, predominant kills uh, areas yeah so i'm not sure what's happened with that now because personnel have moved on from the shropshire council right so it might have been sort of uh binned <laughs> yeah. it might be worth you resurrecting that perhaps Lorcan, and then sending that to catherine and then especially in those areas that she's about to work in yeah well it would be interesting what happens with sedn now that it's moving yeah that would be Alfred. very useful i think it'd be a good uh, opportunity to actually use this project to actually grab their attention back a little bit more and yeah, show that we've, we've actually done something surrounding it and and got this evidence to show them um and it, it could be it could be a good time right now actually for this kind of thing because so i've noticed that right now a lot of people are getting into it and, and realizing and i think um, the message has got out there hasn't it that hedgehogs yeah. are decreasing rapidly so we should be yes. doing as much as we can to save them i mean i'm bumping into people in well not bumping into people but hearing people in supermarkets things saying oh you know i'm i'm buying this cat food for hedgehogs and things I, i'd never thought i'd have ever heard that in my life before but it proves that people are actually getting the message somehow and and, and people stuff. love them so want to do their best for saving them i think i think exactly. presumably people in the past just assumed they were doing well and yeah. getting on with their lives but they're clearly not doing well are they yeah it's just make people realize that they're not going to stay there unless they actually make an effort to save them yeah yeah, yeah exactly so it's a good start <laughs> great thanks then we've got a few other questions so uh I can see a few hands held up. Uh, Nigel is next. Hi, Nigel. Thanks for sending your hands and stuff through. Yes, thank you. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, one thing I was surprised about on the positives for hedgehogs was uh, garden ponds. Now, I know it's fantastic for other wildlife, but I thought it was a negative for um, hedgehogs. I 
with my edge jugs, I put, do put water sources out. I haven't got a pond uh, yeah. for that reason. I know that we can put little ladders in and yeah. different things to get, to get them out, but I thought it was more of a negative on the hedgehog front than a positive. It's, it's more, it's actually a, one of the most brilliant features I, I always recommend because for one point it's this water source that's pretty much going to be there all year round without you having to refill and clean and you know it's it's perfectly there hedgehogs are actually really good swimmers so they are going to be okay if they do um fall in the pond the obvious issue is them getting back out again um which is why we start encouraging gradients uh, or ramps and things like this but the reason I do always put it as a hedgehog friendly feature, a wildlife friendly feature is because it, it won't just benefit hedgehogs. It's bringing this abundance of wildlife to your garden that hedgehogs can then benefit from. So all these insects that are attracted to your pond, you have the pond, uh, the frogs as well. Um, amphibian species. It's, it's not just singularly me singling out what hedgehogs can benefit from it, it it all connects to all wildlife which is why i always put it out there because everyone's going to benefit from it and there's i almost don't see a negative to ponds unless obviously you don't leave a way out for for hedgehogs it's the fact that you've got to expect lots of wildlife to use it um and not just one or the other and, and things like that so that's kind of why i put it out there it's just it attracts so much and and it can really be a big benefit if you let it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Cheers, Nigel. Cheers, uh, cheers. We, we've got another question from Anne-Marie. <coughs> if you, you're okay to unmute yourself, Anne-Marie. Yeah, thank you. And um, thank you for the great talk, Catherine. Um, it was really uh, insightful. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, contribute to it, uh, you know, uh, last year because of COVID of course oh yeah um, but yeah um, mine is actually because um, I have a kind of infrequent kind of hedgehog visitor uh, in my own garden yeah which I never thought that you know we would have because this is quite a uh, kind of urban area yeah um, because <coughs> it is kind of it, it's not frequent in any way and i think it's only like one perhaps two yes uh, coming in and the way that they can get into our back garden is through kind of gap uh at least what i think it is like yeah. a gap between the um what is it the the door whatever it is um okay. yeah kind of the fence yeah. door um, but on the other side is kind of a car park yeah which I am kind of worried about because people like on because there's a another row of houses on the other side of the car park yeah um, and you know people of those houses use it you know to park their cars because there isn't any uh, parking space on the other side of the um, uh, of their houses okay and it's just because it's so kind of infrequent. So like sometimes they come like a couple of nights, you know, I see kind of hedgehog poo or have even sometimes like witnessed them. Um, yeah. Um, but then I'm quite afraid that because there is like really long gaps that absolutely no signs, no sightings, no kind of evidence of them coming or it coming. Um, so I'm always kind of concerned that, you know, it's gone like, you know, just, killed by a car or something yeah i'm just like how could it be because there isn't like much connectivity between gardens around here at least like back gardens okay they're all kind of kind of fenced off it's like how kind of because like that's why i haven't i don't know whether there is a question here at all <laughs> <laughs> so it's just kind of like um, cause I haven't, for example, put out food because they come so infrequently and I don't right. uh, like just wasting food in a sense. Um, but like, would you have like any kind of suggestions of like 
how to well make it more friendly for hedgehogs maybe like try and raise awareness or something yeah. that there are those I mean, around yeah i mean there's obviously a population there if, if you're getting hedgehogs which is really good news they're, they're getting in somehow and they're moving around somehow um so i think a way to start is to just see see try try and get this idea of how other people feel like your neighbors if if they feel the same if they they've seen hedgehogs you can sort of test the waters to see um you know who else might be experiencing the same thing um and in fact, starting to to raise a bit of awareness, particularly that car park, perhaps could be a really cool place to to put some signs up around it um, for awareness. And it's it's a matter of it, in response to your own garden. To be honest, I've even in the peak of summer, I've often had hedgehogs. One week, I'm I'm getting them every single night in the feeding station every single night, and then the next week. I get nothing for like seven days and then they could come back again. And honestly, the, the distances they travel, um, it's particularly females that may stay close, um, smaller territories because they want to stay near their nest sites. They want to stay somewhere, you know, where they know they've got somewhere to nest somewhere safe. It's more males that will just run and run and run and, and, and travel and, you know they they just want the ladies and and to keep going and for food and so you can't really ever predict if your hedgehog's going to come every day you often see people on facebook that are like oh my hedgehog's come again he's we're getting five a night five visitors a night um but no one's ever going to be the same it's a matter of getting an idea of your hedgehog population and perhaps it could be an idea to add your area to the project this year where we could actually start um stimulating a bit of that awareness um to to start to get some answers i suppose um of of what you could do but i would definitely what you can do in your own garden is a great start so you could just keep up the food um keep up with your habitats and i always note in winter right now a lot of people do stop feeding um but i myself i just turn to perhaps the dry food um and maybe feed a tiny bit like a couple days less but I still put it out continuously even if it's not going down all the time because the the fact is hedgehogs will wake up and bumble around especially in the mild spells um, and you can never predict when or when they're not going to come so it's a matter of just being experimental and and, and enjoying it while you're going and, and testing a house out I haven't had a hedgehog in my house my hedgehog house the four years I've had it and then this year we had a hedgehog come in the house so it's it's a matter of of um just just testing the waters in your own garden and perhaps seeing what your neighbors um are seeing as well and again it'd be nice to to bring the project there and see see what we could get and see how we could improve so that would be really good yeah it was um just a, a quick um like if you might be able to kind of send any of kind of um that sort of like um, resources not, yeah yeah resources yeah. as in you know just kind of information leaf absolutely like yeah something like that like through email or something yeah. like that would be great so i could yeah, just I'd be very glad to um neighbors uh kind of um absolutely yeah definitely great. thank you great thank you <laughs> Okay, uh, Dave. Did you want to ask a question? You, you did have your, your hand up, but it's your hands disappeared. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, distracted by the uh, domestics, and um, uh, you know I, I missed part of that presentation, uh, Catherine. Sorry about that, but uh, uh, forgive me if I uh, ask uh, anything or comment on anything that uh, you've already covered. Uh, down here in Clun, we've got a fairly healthy. Um, uh, population both sides of the river, uh, in particular in the elevated sections, not so much in the lower regions down by the river. Um, and um, we get uh, um, very few that I'm aware of uh, road casualties. Um, so, uh, and 
I was just wondering where, how effective you, you might think the um, traffic calming uh, has uh, much of an impact in certainly in the rural areas, particularly the Edgecocks will sort of um, tend to uh, scuttle and travel around adjacent to a margin, a wall, or a path, or something or other in any case. So it, it's not that frequent that they will actually cross the road to get to the other side, but that's another story. Um, but um, um, so how, how, how would we go about uh, getting uh, the area, as it were, onto your um, your hit list of uh, observational or survey uh, things? Oh, obviously, you've got a fairly healthy Doctor Wildlife Trust, uh, the Plum and Bishop, Bishop Catherine Plum branch down here, and everybody is fairly active and, and doing stuff by these methods. We'll have Facebook pages and what have you. Yep. Um, and there's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fairly um, happy that there's a lot of people, well, put it this way, the people who, who have them are very enthusiastic, and there's lots of people who would like them, but not don't necessarily yeah. have them, but are often enthusiastic, and there's other people who don't care. But um, it's, um, uh, you know, ha what's the best way of getting uh, the area, as it were, onto your patch, as it were, onto your radar? Yeah, um, no, I think it's it's perfect um, situation when you have already some people in your area that are getting hedgehogs and then there's others that that want them. That's the whole point of this project is, is brilliant to spread the example of, of other neighbours to others and things. Um, but no, I, I, I would be glad to add your area to our project and the way we can just do that is by you just dropping me an email um, and I can sort of put it into my plan and, and see what sort of month I can sort of dedicate to the area and things like that. Um, I'm, I'd, you can find my email on the web page, but I can also just provide it uh, for you here as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's all it would need, just, just an email. So I know which area it is um, that's interested and I can add them to the list and we can sort of talk about um, um, what your area could do with or, or what they're interested in. Um, I mean, locally in Clunton, we've got uh, Jenny Foster, Alvin Foster, who's a sort of a, a, a hedgehog um, guru, I suppose you could say. Uh, but she's, uh, but she's, um, she nurses them, puts them you know, treats them, and puts them back. Okay. Out. So, you know, there's any number of us who put, um, I mean, I help, out, help her out and all that sort of stuff, but um, I mean, we, um, um, convalescent, shall we say, and then we uh, relocate them. Yeah. Um, so you know, we do redistribute them locally, uh, and there's any number of um, rather good sites actually locally who, uh, uh, and, and people are very much on board in, in having them released in their hatch or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's, um, it's uh, uh, prevalence of um, ticks and fluke is quite a uh, a big issue that we tend to have uh, with the uh, ones that we find that are not particularly um, uh, healthy. Um, and of course, that's predominantly seasonal. Um, yeah. But, uh, is there anything particular to look out for when the um, uh, little monkeys come out of hibernation? Uh, obviously, they'll be needing food and water, and what have you. Um, so, uh, yeah. any suggestions? I think that the main thing you can do um, is make sure everything's ready for them, really. I think winter time is the perfect time to to do a bit of gardening, um, establish these perfect habitats for them. Think of where you could leave a wild area. Just make sure you have everything ready for the, pit, the, the seasons where they do come out. Um, and again it's just keeping an eye out that they're coming out at the right times when they do um and that they are eating and and the, the main things to look out for is of course the big one if the hedgehog's out in the daytime not very good um and you just want to to keep a sort of distanced eye on them um i, I know a few rescues will sort of pick them up and weigh them to make sure they're the right size and things but i would always ask advice from your rescue before you do that um because you never know if you're just causing unnecessary stress and and a lot of people like to 
sort of take rescues into their own hands sometimes without actually contacting their own local rescue and things like that. Um, so the main things right now is just trying to have, have a go at making your garden um, a nice hedgehog friendly environment for them, especially while we're in lockdown and while hedgehogs aren't actively out. Um, so that that's the kind of um, things we could be doing. Um, but I'm glad to actually email out quite a few resources as Anne Marie has asked for and I do have quite a few spare road signs um, if anyone wants to email me and I'm glad to post those out as well. So um, in the meantime, while the project can't 